good morning. Thank you very much for coming to the first Fully Charged Live. Please welcome to the stage your host, Robert Llewellyn. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. For a start, thank you very much for coming, for, for supporting this, the first ever Fully Charged Live. We cannot believe the response. As you can see, it's been fairly intense. But we'll start now, Dale. We should sit down. We should sit down, because we're going to have a little chat, really, about what, what we see as the future, and particularly as Dale's very involved in renewable electricity and the charging infrastructure. Many of, of I know of you will have used it this morning. I think it's worth saying that the Ecotricity team that look after it have been delighted because they've had so many compliments today because they're quite used to getting, you know, the odd complaint. And so they're really thrilled. They've got a team of engineers circling 60 miles around the venue making sure all the chargers are working. It is an amazing achievement that Dale's managed to get every single motorway services bar one in the country. Is that right? Yeah, that's one that doesn't have enough grid. Doesn't have enough grid. Yeah. So if anyone knows how to add some grid to that one, that would be very good. But Dale... Just go quickly, a, a brief history of Ecotricity. When, when did the company start as an electricity company rather than the, the, the network, uh, the charges? Yeah, we began in 1995. I'd just spent a few years trying to build my first windmill. It was just the beginning of the wind industry in Britain. I realised that in order to build more windmills, I needed to reach the end user with this new thing, green electricity. Um, had to become an energy company to do that. Margaret Thatcher was just liberalising the energy industry. I, I don't think, uh, I think she's done anything good except possibly that. <laughs> and uh, it gave us the chance to start and sell a new kind of energy, um, which was quite radical back in the day, uh, 1995. It's, it's fairly common now you see a lot of people selling green energy and then we brought green gas to Britain in 2010 and around about that time got involved in transport uh, I got involved in green energy because it was the biggest single source of uh, carbon emissions and climate change and it was uh, you know around about 2010 that I realized that I should look at the second biggest and the third biggest see what they were that was transport and food and between the three it's 80 percent of everybody's personal carbon footprint and so the choices we make every day in how we power our homes, how we travel and what we eat, uh, they're the biggest changes we can all make. So we set out then to build an electric car in the days before you could buy a Nissan Leaf, for example. And it, it's over there, in case you're interested. The Nemesis electric car is right there, so you can have a look at it. I mean, I think what's interesting is what will happen next, you know, because there is certainly, we're, we're all witnessing it here, there's been a, a shift, and it's still on a very small level if you look at the whole country and the amount of cars that are on the road. You know, electric cars make up a tiny proportion of that, but it's clearly a, a growing proportion. And the, the number of charges, you know, there's not enough charges, that's all we hear about. But actually, there's a lot more than there was, for instance, when I first got a, my Mitsubishi iMeve, there was nowhere. And all there was at that time was three-pin plug-type technology. So we didn't let that hold us back. We uh, did a deal with the motorway uh, network operators and said, we'll put them on. We know that they're not very practical, but it's better than nothing. And other stuff will come quickly. And within 18 months, we were building 50 kilowatt uh, fast chargers, yeah. uh, you know, Chardamo. And, and then CCS has come along and next year we'll be building 350 kilowatt chargers. So we've come a long way in just less than 10 years from a three pin plug yeah. to 350 kilowatt charging. Yeah. Is that the way you see it going forward then, that you'll do more, you'll put in more chargers? I mean, do you think you'll put in more chargers where there are already some existing? Yeah, we, we keep a close eye on the load factor of our existing pumps. We have, uh, we like to call them pumps, by the way, electricity pumps, because it's quite analogous to petrol pumps, and this is what they're really delivering is electricity. Uh, we've got two in every location at least. Uh, we, look, we watch the load factor to make sure that there aren't, you know, queues uh, um, at our pumps and stuff. So uh, we, we'll add more pumps as we need more volume, but we're also trying to keep pace with the changing technology. Yeah. And that's been a bit difficult up until now, but I think things are coalescing around CCS. I think the future of charging standards in, in Britain and Europe is going to be CCS, yeah. which makes it a lot easier for us because currently we're wrestling with three standards. Um, and I think 350 kilowatts CCS is going to emerge as the, uh, you know, the single charging technology. Right. And we'll build that out across our whole network to make sure that we've always got enough capacity for people so that when you get to a pump, it's free uh, and you, know, you can plug in and move on. Yeah. So, I mean, the other thing that I know is there's a lot of talk of, of uh, uh, here with different companies that are doing it, but is putting batteries in at the, at the location of the chargers to kind of act as a buffer. Is that something you're, you're thinking about at Ecotricity? Yeah, 
grid scale battery storage is really interesting in, in a number of ways, um, but to back up uh, card charging uh, posts is, is a good one, particularly if you're in a remote location like a remote area service station where most of ours are, when you don't have a particularly big or strong grid, so you can use the battery to buffer and uh, trickle charge when there's not much demand and, and yeah. deliver it quickly to the cars when they come along. So I think there's definitely a role for that. And there's a role for the batteries in grid scale storage anyway, per se, just connected to the grid, giving and taking to the grid, uh, connected to wind and solar farms in a hybrid situation to balance the different times of the day and the year when you've got energy or you don't have energy, and at the home as well, where you've yeah. got smaller scale, but batteries doing the same job. And it's kind of neat, really, for me, that this ability to do all of this has come out of the car industry. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of actual energy generation, I mean, uh, uh, do you see a change possibly coming in terms of government attitudes to, to wind? Yeah, I think we've seen a couple of comments recently from uh, MP saying, well, maybe onshore wind would be acceptable where it has public support, but that's actually everywhere. So I don't know what they really mean. I think we're more likely to get a change of government than a change of heart from this government. Right. <laughs> some, <laughs> some support there for that comment. We think ahead 10 years. But in 10 years, I mean, you were saying earlier, you think that the, the car industry will have, in 10 years, will have stopped selling fossil fuel cars altogether. It's just my own opinion from uh, watching the news and seeing the rate of change in the industry. Uh, there's, a, there's an acceleration of it to see what's happened in the last 10 years. And uh, manufacturers like Volvo have already declared that they'll be fully electric and hybrid by 2020, yeah. which is just around the corner. And I just believe that within 10 years, uh, we'll have seen that happen, that uh, car companies won't make internal combustion engine cars anymore. They just won't make sense. And there are other indicators like the rapid decline in diesel sales. You can see that. Yeah. I think the same is coming to petrol. And 10 years is a long time, as we've seen. Yeah, yeah. If you look back 10 years, how much it's changed there. Yeah. So the other thing I think is worth mentioning, because uh, I think it's a very important part of what you do, is well, the, the football club, obviously, uh, the, the Forest Green Rovers, the only time I've got a missing gene. Some of my mates tell me I've got missing genes. I don't understand football. But the only time I've ever seen a football match is at Forest Green Rovers. Were you playing Man United? Man uh, United? Yes, but not the first team. Oh, the, the, oh right, yeah. not the first team. Yeah, anyway, they, they were very good. They were very fit, the young men that played. They ran around a lot. I was very impressed. And I also got advice. I, was, I had a, a, the uh, offside rule explained to me by a very nice, very patient man I was sitting next to. And then at the end of the match, he got up and everybody clapped. And I didn't know who he was, but he's quite a well-known footballer. He's, um, and now, of course, I've forgotten his name. Gary Neville. <laughs> Gary Neville. <laughs> he's a really nice bloke, Gary Neville. He's lovely. And he's got an electric car. That's what, we were talking about electric cars. We weren't talking about football. But the, the, I think what's fascinating is that the Forest Green Rovers, for those of you who don't know, are a vegan football team which I think is extraordinary. So well, the, the team are all vegans. I know you're a vegan. Do you see that as a, an equally important step that the human race have to make to survive for longer on the planet? Yeah, I absolutely do. And really it is the three issues of energy, transport and food and 80% of all carbon emissions and unsustainability are in those three things. And they are choices we make every day. But if you look at the food industry in particular, you know, there's a massive global impact and user of resources. And I think we put roughly 10 times more energy into animal farming than we get back out by way of food products. So there are incredible diminishing returns. There are health reasons not to do it as well as environmental. Um, and it's just, I think it's the, the direction of travel of the world, you know, yeah. we, we all need to eat a lot less meat and dairy. Thank you so much, Dale. Thanks for all your support. Oh, thanks for and um, and we'll, we'll be back here in a bit, but thanks very much. We'll see you later on.